I'd like to uh, welcome everybody to our, uh, our first uh, virtual panel discussion event of the uh, semester um, on the uh, Russo-Ukrainian War at uh, one year, or the, just if you want to count it from the uh, um, uh, well, full-scale invasion of Ukraine that took place just about a year ago. Uh, this is a, a virtual panel discussion hosted by the Department of Political Science and our School of Education Behavioral Sciences, um, and it's co-sponsored as well by uh, the MGA Political Science Student Organization and the uh, Alpha Mu Zeta Chapter of Pi Sigma Alpha, which is the National Honorary Society for uh, Political Science um, Research and Students. Um, so before we get started, just very briefly uh, introduce our department, talk a little bit about our department. Uh, we have uh, quite a few different programs th today that are offered uh, both uh, on campus and online. Uh, we have two Bachelor of Science degrees offered in the department in both political science as well as interdisciplinary studies, as well as uh, minors in uh, political science, African and African diaspora studies, environmental policy studies, global studies, uh, pre-law, and we also offer a certificate in European Union studies. So if you're a political science major, that's great. But if you're not a political science major, you can always think about being one, or you can think about you know perhaps doing a minor of you know five or six classes of um, political science or. Uh, global studies or whatever. Um, so something to keep in the back of your mind if you want to think about broadening your degree program, perhaps. Um, so uh, without too much further ado, I want to go ahead and uh, introduce our uh, panelists. Unfortunately, one of our uh, scheduled panelists is not able to make it today, which may partially be accounting for our low turnout. Um, Dr. Hall, uh, Dr. John Hall was going to be joining us today, but uh, he's uh, uh, taken ill, uh, unfortunately, so he's um, not going to be joining us, not feeling a little bit under the weather. Hopefully he'll be back for our next event um, in a couple of weeks, um, but um, uh, we, of course, will send out our best wishes to him for a, a full and quick recovery from uh, hopefully just a, a short-term stomach bug or something. Um, but... Um, our uh, panelists that we do have, uh, of course, should de definitely be able to pull up the, the slack. Um, so we have uh, Dr. Matthew Haverly, who is a lecturer of political science here at Notre Georgia State and has been here uh, for uh, about six and a half years now, um, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, his doctorate is from the University of Florida in Gainesville. Um, and then also we have uh, Dr. Thomas, uh, Thomas Matchock, who is an instructor of political science here at Middle Georgia State, has been with us for uh, almost three years now. Um, he uh, formerly taught at Air University, UNC Greensboro, and the Army War College, um, and is the executive director of the Joint Civil Military Interaction Network. Uh, his doctorate in, in uh, conflict resolution is from uh, Nova Southeastern University. And uh, I am uh, Dr. Christopher Lawrence. I'm the uh, chair of the political science department, also an associate professor of political science. Uh, this is my 11th year at Middle Georgia State, and my doctorate is in political science from the University of Mississippi, um, or Ole Miss. Um, so um, for those of you that have not joined us for an event before, it's uh, going to work fairly um, straightforwardly, I think. Um, we will get started with some uh, questions that I've selected as the moderator. Uh, we will uh, accept our questions through the uh, Q&A and chat windows. Um, might want to try the Q&A window first. We're going to try that out for the first time. I have, um, they just added this feature to Teams, so we'll see how that works. Um, so try to put your questions in the Q&A window. If that doesn't work, then we'll switch to the, the chat window. Um, but um, uh, regardless, I, I will kind of moderate select questions that are uh, submitted through chat. Um, you're certainly more than welcome to ask more than one question, um, but we will prioritize asking one question per participant at the bare minimum, if we can get to all of them, hopefully. Um, and uh, do be courteous and civil to each other. I know that for some people this may be a controversial or uh, very much uh, perhaps even personal topic. Um, and so uh, I do want to make sure that we are bearing in mind that we need to be uh, civil and courteous to each other in the discussion, even if we have some uh, differences about the issues at play here. Um, so these are just uh, some examples, some questions you may be getting to on uh, things like the current historical background of the conflict, uh, current developments in the conflict, uh, Joe Biden's visit uh, this uh, past week uh, probably will come up, as well as 
where do we go from here? What is the exit strategy? What is the off ramp? Is there an off ramp? That sort of thing. Uh, and then uh, situations involving the support for, you, uh, for Ukraine from its uh, neighbors and other allies as well, and whether those are going to persist, as well as uh, perhaps the involvement of uh, other countries like China, South Africa may come up as well. Um, so we got lots and lots of different uh, topics that we could be discussing, and I will uh, make this window go away so you can see more of our faces um, and uh, get started with our uh, questions if everybody is uh, ready to go ahead and get started. There we go. So, um, so if uh, Matt and Tom are ready, we'll go ahead and uh, start with our first question. Um, so just kind of as a background question uh, to get everybody up to speed, um, what what are the major cultural, historical, and geographical connections and distinctions uh, between the two countries that are primarily in the conflict, Russia and Ukraine? I don't know if uh, Matt, if you want to start here. I, I I don't know. Uh, uh, if if so, uh, I'm willing to start. If uh, if uh, unless Tom, okay. Uh, well, <clears throat> so without with, without uh, going going into uh, ex exhausting detail, um, uh, Ru Russia and Ukraine um, actually uh, have kind of the same historical origination point. Uh, uh, they, they both kind of come out of the ninth century, um, out of out of a, a polity that was 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 called a, a Rus Kiev, uh, and so I, I part of of this di this debate really about uh, between Russia and, and Ukraine uh, is that. Um, there's a there's a common historical lineage, but uh, it, it's created sort of differing uh, legends in, in, in what it means um, to the Russians. What it means is uh, is uh, sort of the imperial destiny of Russia uh, uh, to the Ukrainians. What it means is a um, a long held nationalist fight uh, for their own nation state. Uh, a, a struggle of, uh, against um, larger empires uh, who over the years occupied their territory. Uh, and so a, a, a part of this whole debate is a debate about imperialism versus nationalism. And, and so that was somewhat captured in, in a recent uh, interview, uh, I should say speech, uh, not really an interview. Uh, Vladimir Putin um, kind of questioned the even the right of, of of Ukraine to exist, but uh, it, it it comes down to even things. For instance, if if you talk to uh, uh, the Ukrainian government, uh, they don't even like the terms that sometimes that are used regarding them when they say the Ukraine, because that translates as the borderland, and and what they see it as under those per uses is that that uh, Ukraine turns into sort of just a a um, a colony, if you will, of Russia, and so that is what I would think. I'm sure Tom's going to going to come in here and expand on this, but I would say that that's kind of they have a mutual origination point, but that the interpretation of what that origination point means lies at the heart of the conflict between uh, these two countries, and of course their differential power. Uh, again, you got an imperial force versus a national force. So I will. Shut up now. <laughs> oh, uh, great, great, Matt. And there's, there's not, there's not much I can, I can add to uh, what you, uh, uh, <clears throat> how, you, how you described it. But, uh, however, what I would um, uh, like to, to throw into the, to, into the discussion, is exactly as you pointed out, is how the these two, um, uh, two nation states took divergent paths. So they they share this common origination point as you um, as you rightly point, uh, discussed, and then they 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 took a, a different path. The the other part and a huge part of that, and I think which is relevant to our discussion today, is that the U is that Ukraine preceded Russia, that 
that the, the Muscov in, in Russia followed um, <clears throat> uh, Ukraine. So even in, from a historical perspective, Ukraine is the, is the first um, and, and Russia uh, followed afterwards. And I, I think that's, that's relevant today. Certainly it was relevant um, in, uh, in the uh, late 1800s, early 1900s, um, in the, in the Russo, uh, Russian Crimean War and, and so forth and so on. And so I, I think also th this common ancestry, and that may not be the right word, but this, this common uh, history that they share has been a part of an ongoing lengthy <laughs> uh, conflict between uh, these two, two countries and even before they were countries. So what we, what we see today, and I think from a historical perspective and certainly one from a conflict resolution perspective is that um, this, this, is, this is a lengthy discourse. And oftentimes we, we look at a conflict that originates and say, oh gee, look at this, um, this bounded uh, war, but we don't put it in the context of several hundreds and hundreds of years of, of, of stress and friction and conflict uh, within this region. So that that would is all I would really add to that. Uh, I think Matt, you 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 pointed out the, the history in, in perfectly. <clears throat> okay, thanks. Uh, and before we move on to the next question, I just want to uh, make one introduction that I forgot to introduce in the uh, beginning, and that is our uh, uh, dean, Dr. David Beek, is also decided uh, or is able to join us this evening. So I want to thank him for uh, joining us and also for the uh, school co-sponsoring our uh, event. Um, I don't, I don't know. I don't want to put Dave on the spot and ask him if he wants to have anything to say, but if he does, uh, uh, he's, more, of course, more than welcome to. Um, but um, I'll give him about 10 seconds, maybe. Doesn't sound like it. So I will uh, um, move on if he does want to say something or uh, later on, we'll sort of let him do so. Um, so on to our second question. Um, uh, kind of following on from the first in some ways. Uh, wh why do you think that Russia does want to control at least some, if not all, of uh, modern Ukraine, uh, particularly the uh, Crimean Peninsula and the Donbass region in the east? Well, I, I don't know if you want to to do the reverse. Do you want, want me to go go again, Tom, or or do you want? Okay. Uh, so, um, well, <clears throat> so a lot of this. Uh, Again, not to to overly historicize all of this, but uh, but um, when Russia was uh, developing as an imperial power um, in the late 18th century, um, they conquered Crimea, uh, and that became, of course, one of the sources that. A century after that was involved in the Crimean War that involved so many European great powers um, in the 1850s. Uh, and during the early days, if you will, of the Cold War, Stalin, um, who was a Georgian, by the way, in his own ethnicity, um, he handed Crimea back. Of course, you all understand something is back within the, the USSR, so it's not really back, but but he handed it back to uh, the, um, the the so the the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic. That That's what the USSR called their uh, I guess roughly equivalent would be like states in the United States was was they referred to them as Soviet. So a Soviet was a was a workers group in, in uh, communist ideology. Um, a workers parliament. So that's and even for that matter, uh, speaking of of uh, a sort of uh, you know one of the great Soviet leaders, uh, uh, Brezhnev was himself a Ukrainian. Uh, so uh, the um, part of this is that one of the ways in which Russia imperialized was that Russia used to do a lot of sort of internal colonization. They would move people around, so they would move people out of places. They would also move people into places, and so they settled Russians into um, what ostensibly you could think of as Ukrainian territory. They also took Ukrainians out of that territory and spread them in, 
and other places. And then they opened up avenues for an internal um, immigration or migratory process. For instance, large numbers of Ukrainians migrated um, toward the 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 more Asian side of uh, of uh, of uh, Russia uh, back into the 19th century, the early, the 18th and 19th centuries. So they did a lot of this kind of stuff, and it was one of the ways in which they imperialized. And so the Americans made a big deal of, about this as sort of against the Soviets. But the truth of the matter, this was something the Russians have always done. Uh, this is Russia being Russia. Uh, one of those areas that wound up with a lot of settler population of Russians was the Donbass region. So basically, eastern Ukraine and the Crimea, which is in southern Ukraine, are pockets of Russian migrants. Um, that have now lived there in many cases for generations and uh, have built up their own cultures and, and, and so on and so forth, uh, so much so that you could find in certain places in, in Ukraine, you can utilize the Russian language uh, alternatively to the Ukrainian language because of, of openings that different Ukrainian leaders have had differing um, relationships with different Russian leaders. But that's what's happening. So what Russia has has claimed, what what Putin has has argued, is something that, and, and I'll, I'll let Tom talk more about this because uh, he's the expert here. But it's, it's referred to as irredentism. But the idea is that you should you take back territory that you once held, and so he makes that claim with things like the Donbass and the Crimea, and to some extent he seems to have even argued for the entirety of the whole country. Uh, in that, but uh, anyway, that's that's what I'll put in there. I'll let Tom take over because I know he's more of an expert in in these matters than I am. Well, you're you're kind, Matt. <laughs> Which, uh, um, sure, no, I you know absolutely um, everything you said, and what I would add to that is um, this irredentism that you you speak of is that. Russia continues to view itself, and again, what we talk about is, is not, it doesn't matter very all that much what we think of Russia, it's what Russia thinks of itself, certainly from a, a conflict perspective. And Russia views itself as an empire. Uh, now, we, we remember that at the close of World War I, if anything happened, we, we realized the collapse of empires. However, R Russia didn't experience that collapse. And so uh, through its Soviet uh, period and now into, into uh, current period, it's, it still views itself as an empire and wants to reestablish itself that, as, you, as Matt Riley points out, as an imperial power within what, what had been, say, the Soviet sphere, if we looked on the map and we looked at those satellite states. And so going into Ukraine uh, allows it to begin to push itself out as that imperial power and to influence um, ge uh, the geopolitical landscape, um, because then it has its eyes on, on Georgia, on Moldova, on Romania. You know, and so you just go through the, the laundry list of, of, of former Soviet satellite states. That's why they're all worried. That's why they're they're all looking or, you know, looking over their shoulder to, to see where Russia is at, because it it this is. There, there is no Russia unless it's an empire, and and so it it has. To, when we talk about you know existential uh, fights, Russia's in an existential fight for its own identity in this in this new geopolitical space that's that's being created, and so uh, this is where where then Putin comes up with with the comment that there is no Russia without Ukraine. He's absolutely correct <laughs> because. Uh, uh, Anyway, so now the the so I, I would add that uh, to to what um, Matt had said. Out the other thing I would add is you know why Crimea, and I think too we have to take an, a, a a broader, a br very broad view of why Crimea, and one one of the the very important reasons is its strategic location on the Black Sea, and a a, a port for for uh, Russia's Black uh, Black Sea fleet. So it's it's a warm water port. Uh, of course, they they have a the you know the uh, uh, Vladivostok and in, in some other uh, 
ice, <laughs> cold ice. But for, to have a, a warm water port that they can move in and out of, Crimea gives that to them because then they can sail through the Dardanelles, which then gives them uh, the second most important part of Crimea, and that is access into uh, 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 Middle East, North Africa. Because as, you're, uh, as we remember, Russia was, was pretty much moved out of um, Middle East, North Africa as a player and was only really able to reestablish itself by aligning with Syria, but it was only able to do that after it had annexed Crimea, allowing its uh, sea fleet um, unrestricted access to uh, North Africa. So now uh, not only is Russia pushing itself out west into former Soviet satellite states, it's also reestablishing itself in the Middle East, North Africa. And Crimea allows it to do all, both those things. Um, so that, I, I, I guess I would be most of what I would add to uh, add to the discussion. Okay, thanks. Um, we did have one uh, clarification from the chat regarding uh, the history of the uh, situation with Crimea. Um, uh, it was correctly pointed out in the chat that uh, it was actually uh, Khrushchev or under Khrushchev that uh, Crimea was uh, moved from uh, Russian jurisdiction to Ukrainian jurisdiction. Um, I think it was 1956, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but um, regardless, um, <clears throat> you know, as as Matt rightly pointed out, uh, within the Soviet Union, that was kind of an academic exercise since, um, you know, Ukraine had no real sovereignty of its own, or for that matter, Russia had no real sovereignty of its own either, um, under at least to the in practice uh, in, in the Soviet era. Um, so uh, let's, uh, I guess, uh, our final kind of update sort of thing. Where, where, where do things stand compared to how they were uh, when we last discussed this? I guess we last discussed this about five months ago in October. Um, at that point, I think, um, you know, the Ukrainian forces were kind of on the offensive, if I'm not mistaken, um, in both the south and the east. It uh, seems like things have uh, kind of slowed down a little bit since then. Um, but uh, what, what would your uh, take on the uh, current uh, status be as far as where, where things stand and where things, at least in the short term, seem to be uh, going in terms of, you know, the, the battlefront and that sort of thing? I don't know if Tom, if you want to start on this one, since uh, Matt started on the last couple or? Sure, sure. No, I, I, I can do that. Um, yeah, I think uh, that as you as you as you point out, uh, Chris, we've all, we're almost at a at a point of stasis, where where um, both sides uh, have slowed down. Certainly, the fighting has not necessarily slowed down, but um, strategic operations have have are, are coming to a stasis now. There's several reasons. One, you know, the fighting season. With this odd way of, of characterizing it, but it's certainly um, a concern. Um, the other is just the, the logistical realities of, of having to uh, to resupply, to have to um, uh, reconstitute. Certainly, when we uh, look at Russia, it's trying to uh, uh, conscription, bring in more more troops. It's trying to uh, to prepare itself for uh, another offensive, which certainly Ukraine is 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 waiting for. Now, the, and I think that some of this flows into, uh, as you mentioned, uh, one of the questions about talking about Biden's uh, visit and so forth and so on. And that is, what, what do we want to have happen here? I think um, this, if this year has told us one thing, it's that uh, we really have not identified what our goals and objectives are um, in this fight between uh, Ukraine and uh, and Russia, uh, we we've talked a lot about democracy. We've talked about a lot about the future of the West. We've talked, uh, you know, uh, a lot about um, uh, the fight in 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 Ukraine is really a fight here for American uh, hegemony in the world and and our stature in the world, so forth and so on. But we really haven't articulated, you know, what do we want to have happen here? Do we want Ukraine to win this war, or do we want do we want Russia to lose this war? What will what will it, what will the, the world look like after um, there is some kind of resolution to what is what is happening now? And without that having being said, I think um, right now we also have military folks trying to figure out 
what's happening here? How, how do we move forward? How do we how do we move the ball down the field um, when we we don't have enough Leopard tanks? Uh, when the M1 tanks won't show up for another year? Uh, when we're not given enough uh, our, our, we're not giving artillery range uh, artillery pieces with long enough ranges to uh, hit logistical sites uh, that the that the Russians have. So I think the the just the natural flow of events are causing things to slow down while while all the forces are trying to figure out, okay, what what's phase two of this thing? Um, we fought ourselves to this kind of stasis and and now we have to there's there has to be some type of 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 of, of uh, activity that will will move us to to phase two. So I, I think that's where we're at right now. Um, is is people, and, and again, uh, uh, Ambassador John Herbst uh, wrote uh, in, uh, writing with um, uh, the uh, Atlanta Council brought this up as well, and that is, what are we trying to do here? Um, uh, uh, President Biden's comment was, uh, I think, his close quote was, you know, we're with Ukraine as long as it takes, and I and I think part of that then is as long as what takes. Uh, to to defeat Russia, <laughs> to to uh, have regime change, to you know whatever. So I think that I think if if that made any sense, I think that's where we're at right now. Yeah. Well, I think that 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 more than covers everything. But I I, I will add that the uh, um, <clears throat> so both sides are um, somewhat rearming uh, during this time. Um, so the the um, the uh, and both sides are reaching out to other potential partners to help them rearm. Um, and um, I was listening on a a, a, a radio uh, cast on on NPR. Um, I was talking about the the in the last year. Uh, both sides, if you will, have really spent their much of their um, field armor capability, um, and so that's part of the reason why the, the the call on Zelensky's side, the Ukrainian side, to get um, um, American and other European, uh, the British and the Germans and so forth, uh, uh, the Swedes and whatnot, sending other additional armor uh, capabilities, because on the ground this is an armor war. Um, the uh, Russians themselves now, as uh, as there there are, I saw some data that said that they've lost a uh, forty percent of their armor capability. But what what that data was referring to was their deployed field army. Now that doesn't so that shouldn't be thought of as their actual armor capability. Their actual armor capability is much larger than that. Um, um, the the Russians, quite frankly, have two million people in the reserves uh, alone. Um, and, and that's even without a more aggressive uh, call up of their draft forces. But on, on, on both sides, uh, what you have is, is you is uh, they're they're replenishing. Uh, they're trying to replenish their armor stocks and they're trying to replenish their manpower stocks. I saw another data. It was 200 the Russians have taken 200,000 ca casualties. Uh, now, that includes wounded and KIA. Uh, but the. Um, um, the Ukrainian forces are much smaller, uh, writ large, they're much smaller. So uh, um, they don't need to take as much to feel it more. Uh, uh, and there is a, a difference also in the sort of ways of war. Uh, the Russians are known for not worrying that much about casualties. Uh, uh, whereas the Ukrainians, at a minimum, are trying to Put up a good front with the West, and a part of putting up a good front in the West is that you treat your soldiery like the human beings that they are. Um, uh, Putin doesn't have to worry about that, uh, but Zelensky does. So they're 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 taking stock and they're they're re they're re upping. A, um, I saw some things that talked about the possibility uh, once we get further once we get into spring. Uh, of of uh, renewed offensives on both sides, 
Um, but I question, uh, much like what Tom brought up, I question whether either side has significant capabilities in place to do that. Um, um, and, and I could be completely wrong, but I mean, it's going to be, um, um, they've got to get the troops up there and they have to be trained. And right now, uh, you know, the Russians called up 300,000 troops, but uh, for the most part, they have to, they have to train them up. Uh, and uh, it's going to take a little bit just to get there. I mean, even even though they're known for their, you know, run people through in a couple of months and send them right in the front. But uh, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I could be wrong, uh, but I, I, I don't think we're going to really see a major offensive in the immediacy like some of the reports. I could be wrong. Uh, I think that if we do see offensives, I, do, I think it'll be closer to the late spring, uh, early summer before that happens. Also, that would be more conducive, particularly for um, tracked and wheeled armored vehicles. Uh, and again, that's what that's what they're fighting with. Uh, this is not a this is not Vietnam. Uh, they're not a bunch of light infantry running around. Uh, so, um, and in fact, it, they're they all come out of the old Warsaw Pact. Soviet army days, and that's what that armies were built on. Um, so that's where I think that's that's the only thing I would I would add on that. That's so. But like I said, I, I've been wrong before. I'll be wrong again. So just um uh, just kind of follow up and may, maybe nail that down a little more. I guess um you know uh, what what is the uh, this is me trying to I think this certain kind of in real time is you know what 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 does kind of get things out of the stasis stalemate whatever is it is it the change in weather is it the arrival of new weapons is it some sort of political decision to it's like okay I, we've been sitting around for six months and we haven't done anything we need we need to get off the pot and really kind of show that we're I mean, well, which of those, if any, or maybe some combination of those, do you think is what's kind of the the next part? Well, if if, if I, it's all right, Matt, I'll jump in. I, sure. I, I I think there's a couple of things, and 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 we're beginning to beginning to see them. And I think it's also important to uh, remember that as um, make a real quick note here. Um, is the Russians? The Russians are fighting. They're fighting two wars. So the 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 one that we pay a lot of attention to is, of course, uh, what's happening on the battlefield: tanks, troops, um, certainly casualties, uh, casualties, numbers, and so on and so on. But the 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 Russians are also also engaged in political warfare, and that political peace doesn't often get as much attention. I'm, I'm swinging this, Chris, to your question, I think. Mm -hmm. And that is uh, that Putin and, 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 and Russia is, is recognizing uh, that they have to fight a, a political war. And they've been, they've been doing this ever since um, uh, 45. And for instance, uh, just recently, what the past couple of days, um, Putin came out and said, well, we're pulling out of the START Treaty with the United States, uh, Strategic Arms uh, Reduction Treaty. And that, that's just a veiled nuclear threat. And from a political warfare standpoint, what Putin is trying to do is cause political tension within the United States between the Democrats and the Republicans. And he's doing he's doing a pretty good job of it now because uh, some of the Republicans are beginning to talk about uh, giving a blank check to Ukraine. What's all this money for? Why are we uh, why are we supporting Ukraine and so forth? And this plays right into the uh, to political warfare of Russia. Uh, also looking for ways to to split the, the NATO alliance. As you remember, he tried to weaponize um, uh, oil. Uh, only, only the winter over over in Germany didn't didn't play into his hand, and it was a mild winter, <laughs> and so uh, the weaponization of that oil didn't work out real well. But he, so he's fighting a war on all these different fronts, uh, not just with with tanks and and artillery pieces, um, and he, he's conducting cyber attacks, information wars, uh, influence operations, uh, which which is characterized uh, by many as the, the, the Gerizimov doctrine, 
Um, and so I think whenever we look at, you know, how's the war going, the second question is which one? Mm -hmm. uh, is it the, the, the one on the battlefield or is it the political warfare? Uh, because in, in, this, in this regard, uh, Russia's making some headway on that political warfare front. As we, we also have to remember that, that most of the world doesn't care about this war, doesn't see it as their war. Certainly Africa doesn't. Many countries in Africa do not. And they're hedging their bets. They're, they're holding their cards close to their vest here. And, and they're seeing Russia as, as standing up against the oppressor, against the, uh, the, the West, the United States. And so they, they view, they're viewing Russia as, as hey, <laughs> look, look at this. And so, you know, they're, they're, they're holding on to now. And we, we've seen some overtures by uh, South Africa. Um, we see that India is still, uh, still staying, uh, staying away um, because they see it as a, as a European conflict, not as a global one. Um, and so uh, on, the, on, the, on the battlefield, I think the Ukrainians have done a bang up job uh, along with uh, in holding, uh, holding Russia at bay. No one, I don't think anyone ever thought they were going to be able to do that. Um, and they have and kudos to them. And they, uh, they're just proving themselves to be incredibly uh, competent soldiers. However, on the political warfare front, that's a whole different picture, I think. Um, we, I, I, I see uh, Russia making some headway there. Um, and um, uh, especially when we talk about, uh, about information warfare. Uh, so. um, very good, Tom. You know, anything I would add, it, 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 a, a predictor point might be some kind of measure of critical mass. Uh, it went, once you got a critical mass on either side, where they thought they could they could conduct uh, an offensive, um, they they would. And and on the the, the political question, you know, Cloud, the famous Clausewitzian uh, uh, dictum, you know, war is politics, a policy by other means. Um, the uh, uh, that's always always going to be a going to be a factor. Um, um, again, I know I I, I listened to a a, a, a cast on a, a, a radio cast of, uh, uh, about the Indians, um, and so the the Biden administration is not too happy with <laughs> with India right now uh, because uh, India is like, yeah, we're we're going to deal with the Russians because we need the Russians to hold the Chinese at bay, um, and so there's a uh, in some ways, the the conflict is is uh, is looked at as a isolated. Well, that's a them thing. But in other ways, it's part and parcel of of, of globalized uh, of power orders. And um, and uh, this is this is uh, this is a, an ongoing an ongoing thing. Uh, but I think I think we should look on both sides, maybe for a certain degree of uh, of critical mass, and uh, that might be a predictive point at that point. If you're looking for a metric to try to measure from. Okay, great. Um, so um, I guess kind of tying into the political question here, um, the political positioning, um, you know, obviously, as we said before, uh, you know, Joe Biden made a fairly unexpected visit to uh, Kiev uh, earlier this, or Kiev this uh, earlier, I guess, uh, this week or over the past week. Um, what, if any, impact do you think that's likely to have on the, on the conflict, both in terms of the uh, situation on the ground in Ukraine, I guess, but also in that broader political question of, you know, does this kind of rally mm. support uh, uh, in the West, particularly um, um, in a way that, um, you know, wasn't there, say, a few weeks ago? Okay, I, I jump in again, Matt. If you, don't, if you <laughs> is um, and that's and that's a great question because for, you know certainly um, the the Ukrainians uh, really uh, <clears throat> appreciated, I think, uh, Biden's visit uh, there. Certainly, the the U.S. has been an incredibly key player um, in this. Uh, the United States has stepped forward and, and provided the leadership within NATO uh, that has been needed. Uh, uh, to, to bring the to hold this uh, alliance together in, in support of Ukraine. Now, very specifically, and I'll just talk about one point um, <clears throat> regarding uh, Biden's visit uh, to, to, to Ukraine. It, within Russia, it, it was viewed as humiliating to, 
to Russia, that the, the president of the United States was able to come to Kyiv and walk around uh, Kyiv with Zelensky while air raid sirens are going off. Um, so just, just a slap in the face uh, to Russia that, that this occurred. Uh, also considering that Putin has never visited uh, the front lines of, of, of his troops. And what, what that now has done is if we look back to at Putin, he, his problems are really within his own country coming from those further to the right than him. So the, the, the pressure and the criticism of Putin is that he's not been aggressive enough, that he's not been fighting hard enough. Um, and, and so he's, his political life right now depends on being even more <laughs> violent and aggressive uh, to keep the far right with, w w that's pushing against him away. And so now when, when Biden comes in and visits uh, into Kiev, I mean, that, that far right now is even more animated and pushing against uh, 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 Putin. And ostensibly, that's one of the reasons he said, well, I'm gonna pull out of the START Treaty with the United States, um, was to do something to try and uh, assuage the, the, uh, the struggle he's having uh, with the far right in his own country. Because uh, when we talked back in October and when we talked back um, in February uh, uh, of last year, one of the things we talked about, well, if, if Putin's not there, if, if, if Putin is, is moved out of office, Putin, well, what we realize now is um, that the people behind him are even further <laughs> to the right than he is. Um, so uh, we, we pretty much have to manage uh, that as well. Do we deal with Putin or do we deal with people that are even worse than him right now? Uh, so it, and that's, that's really all I would add to that. Uh, but it don't. Uh, so it's always a uh, a major deal in 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 national security policy when the president goes and gives a presentation, and and, um, and particularly when the president links up with his opposite head of state uh, for that country. Uh, so um, this has. Um, at least in the short term, this has brought a level of um, of uh, public exposure, uh, or I should say, a re-exposure uh, to um, the plight of the Ukrainians, uh, to the the perceived and real viciousness of the Russians, and um, the and of course the the call. And of of uh, that was remember that President Zelensky, uh, not that long ago, uh, came to the Capitol and gave a speech uh, to a joint session of Congress, um, and about the the recent deals. Um, and so I think to some extent, um, you know, Putin Putin and Biden are are both uh, uh, trying to kind of one up each other a little bit. This is kind of a, it's what the international relations theory they like to call tit for tat. Old game theory type stuff, and um, that that's what's going because they they're 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 in a dance they're in they're in a power dance, uh, but of course, whenever it's the U.S. and and a and a near peer like Russia or China or somebody like that, it's it, it's uh it's very dangerous because you're talking about particularly when you know when when Biden or when when Putin throws down the gauntlet and he says, well, I'm not going to observe Start Two. Um, uh, that amps up the the level of the security threat. Um, the security dilemma goes up because the 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 great problem with strategic weapons is that um, to some extent you can't use them. I mean, they're they're things you can you can you you have to have them, and you and you we play these games with each other on them. But at the end of the day. Um, you know, as, as I said, I know there's a few of my students that are in the in the um, audience today. As, as I as I mentioned in one of the, the lectures that, you know, Albert Einstein had said that uh, that uh, uh, we're, we're uh, 
I don't know what weapons World War III would be fought with, but I, I know that World War IV will be with sticks and stones. Uh, and what he meant by because of the sheer power of strategic weapons today is that they, they could destroy the world. Uh, and so uh, I would caution everybody when when the leader of Russia is talking that way, um, that that's not I don't want people to run out and go down into bunkers or something. But I mean, it, it's a uh, it's definitely has raised up the uh, raised up the rhetoric. Um, and so this this is uh, they're playing they're playing the the game of of, of high politics. Um, and so um, we'll we'll see how this how this plays out. But uh, it's it's definitely worrisome. If 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 I could uh, just add to that, thank you, uh, Matt. Uh, there is there's also an, I think it's important for us as well. In in of course we're a political science department. You know, there is this this recognition that the, the geopolitical landscape is 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 shifting right uh, as we as we stand on it. And one of the things. I think many people have not come to terms with, uh, certainly those I, I speak with, whether it's within it, within the US or a, um, EU context, is that the, the 75 years of, or thereabouts post-World War II, the Cold, the Cold War, uh, you know, major Cold War era, was an, is an anomaly in world history that that <laughs> world history is is is, is, is for political theory jungle theory and um the survival of the fittest and it, as you said it, it's power uh power relations um it's um that that the the world that uh, that arrived in in 1648 in westphalia is is collapsing around us and we're trying to understand what's going on with a cold war framework um, and I, I think we're, it's a kind of a Procrustean bed where we're taking this, this shifting geopolitical landscape and, and pulling it and, and tugging it and, and trying to fit it inside this Cold War bed that we're, the world made perfect sense to us. Um, and that's no more. <laughs> it's, it is now, uh, we could characterize it as ancient history. And we're going to have to find new ways to understand this shifting landscape um, and these different power relations. Uh, one of the things we, we talk about, uh, Matt, as you talked about in class, one of the things we talk about in our, our IR class is that the, the two countries that, that benefited the most from the post-World War II framework and the institutions of peace were Russia and China. And, and though they are now, as, as you said, near peers, uh, uh, in this geopolitical landscape, uh, because they benefited so much uh, from that post World War II framework, and now we're having to deal with that. We're having to to understand what does it mean to have these three behemoths <laughs> uh, roaming the this geopolitical landscape, um, and and so that we're we're challenged as well <laughs> in in just trying to to make sense of it. So going back to earlier. Point. And again, I um, kind of want to follow up here on, um, uh, you know, the, the propaganda value of, um, you know, Biden appearing in, you know, in in the Ukrainian capital. And, and by the way, also being able to ride a train to and from the Ukrainian capital. Can you imagine, you know, the, just the, you know, you, you would think that that would be like critical infrastructure. You would have taken out like in the first week of the war, um, but you can still like ride a passenger train to Kiev, apparently, just like like nothing um you know that, that doesn't sound like a you know very effective war on uh, on the russians behalf from my perspective at least um but but given the you know the the point about putin in the front i i'm, I'm curious uh, and i i don't have a specific recollection of this but uh to my knowledge he has not even set foot in crimea uh, as a since 2014 um so, I mean, is there, I mean, I realize that public opinion doesn't really work the same way in a um, near totalitarian, certainly authoritarian dictatorship um, that it does in, say, Western country. But, um, you know, I mean, obviously, you know, the contrast of Putin not 
setting foot in all this, you know, core Russia um, for the last nine years uh, versus, you know, Joe Biden wandering around, you know, the streets of Kiev, like it's, you know, Washington, D.C. Um, you know, how, uh, I mean, I realize that's, how does Putin get to that point where he lets himself be embarrassed that way, I guess, is um, the the question I'm trying to wrap my head around is, you know, surely he has to have some sort of propaganda value. I mean, it's not like the, uh, you know, it's not like the Chinese are afraid to be seen in Tibet. Um, so well, what's the deal there, I guess? <laughs> Is it is it just that he doesn't want to provoke the Ukrainians by showing up in, in Crimea? Um. Well, uh, so one thing I, I would just add on uh, I, on the issue on the issue with Kiev. Um, remember that in the early days of either, if you want to call it the current war or the current iteration of the the conflict dating all the way back to twenty fourteen. Um, is um, that Putin tried to take Kiev. Mm -hmm. He tried to take Kiev, uh, and uh, he he did it with massive strikes. Uh, the the thing is, he couldn't he couldn't put he couldn't get enough significant numbers of troops on the ground and, and so forth. He couldn't um, he couldn't operate. What he tried to do is he tried to get it with an air war, uh, and and a rocket and artillery bombardment and. Uh, and as as Tom has pointed out, the uh, the Ukrainians somewhat survived surprise. Maybe didn't I don't think they surprised themselves, but they surprised everybody else uh, in their ability to uh, to to be the David against Goliath. Um, so that that's part of what's answering the 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 infrastructure issue there. He tried and failed, um, and he mostly did that because I think he he his people his advisors underestimated the will of the Ukrainians and they un underestimated, they overestimated the capabilities of the Russian rocket forces, the strategic rocket forces uh, for their ability to take out uh, key infrastructure and have a whole thing collapse. And that's actually a, a, a common uh, mistake that's happened throughout time. I mean, you know, there was a even in the United States back in the 1920s, they used to talk about Billy Mitchell was running around. Well, you you didn't need armies anymore because you could win with bombers and so on and balloons and dirigibles. And of course, World War II happened and we dropped a ton of bombs. And at the, at the end of the day, you needed you needed infantrymen to hold, you needed armor to, to take it and infantrymen to hold the ground. Um, and in some ways, warfare hasn't changed in that sense. So so that that's that's part of it. There was an underestimation. There was an overestimation. Um, and when the the propaganda point uh, with Putin, I would say, is that this is just a guess. This is just a guess on his internal circle. You know, as Tom pointed out, he has to keep certain people happy because they keep him in power. And um, he might be operating under a psychology that if I step foot in, even in Crimea or, or, or in the Donbass region, or, you know, which would be relatively safe places for him to go. But if I do that, then what I'm risking is I'm giving legitimacy to those upstarts, those, uh, those, um, uh, those little people who should be quaking in their boots on me. So that might be it. It might be sort of a reverse image, whereas Biden wants to be seen, Putin might feel or might have advisors telling him being seen on the ground might not have that a positive effect on public opinion and might have the opposite, particularly the opinion that matters to him, which are the opinion of the oligarchs. Uh, so that's a that's just a a, a, a little bit of a, of, of a look in that. And it's also something to keep in mind that remember that that Joe Biden is an American politician, a Western politician generally. He thinks in terms of winning the hearts and minds of the people. And Zelensky has clearly bought into that, uh, which is not true, by the way, of some of his predecessors as Ukrainian presidents. Um, 
but Putin is from a different school. And, you know, Putin's Putin's school of thought is that he's he's the, the man of steel. Uh, and to some extent, the man of steel remains that because he hides behind the curtain. Um, is we don't get to see what the wizard actually looks like. So that that's that's a little that that might be a little bit off in the weeds on that. But that, but that that's a way maybe to think about why it is the way it is. But I've spoken too much. So I'm going to shut up. No, I, no, thanks, Matt. And what, what, what I would add to that is I think, I think, uh, you know, on, on some of this too, you know, <laughs> talk about some things you say, well, gee, we wish we weren't talking about that. But, um, you know, look, the, the optics were, were fantastic of, um, of uh, uh, Biden uh, walking around Kiev, as I said, with the air raid sirens uh, with Zelensky. And as, as I think, Matt, you, you, you point out, and I don't want to be too cynical, <laughs> Um, however, uh, Biden's age is coming to question uh, whether or not he's going uh, to get the, uh, the nomination by the Democratic Party uh, to run uh, for another four years. So he, this is sure, certainly the optics are he's, he's a vibrant 80-some-year-old um, 80, 80 uh, world leader. And here he is in a combat zone walking around uh, Kiev with, uh, with another world leader uh, showing, that, showing that strength. So that that that's not going to hurt him uh, 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 as as he's getting ready to uh, to run for another 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 term. Um, Putin doesn't have that problem. Um, he's he's an authoritarian that's that's moving toward becoming a totalitarian, um, and so he doesn't have necessarily a, um, a, po a, po a population that he has to to appease. That's already happened. Uh, the dissenters within Russia, we don't even see pictures of them anymore. Uh, so the, the, he, he doesn't he doesn't deal with that. The the other point I would would just make in. I don't know what this directly relates to, but I know it relates to what we're talking about. And that is um, when you say, well, you know, what's going on? You know, what, what what's happening uh, with the, the politics within Russia? Uh, some years ago. The United States made a, a decision to rely on intelligence gathering primarily through signals, or what we call SIGINT, uh, signals intelligence. And we, we moved away from human or human intelligence. And that led, I think, to um, uh, an overestimation of the strength of the, of the Russian military and its capabilities. Because we just simply no longer had, for lack of a better word, spies on the ground. <laughs> who were were drawing a picture uh, of what the what the Russian military looked like, so we could make realistic um, assessments. And uh, I think that we simply overestimated what they were capable of doing. And uh, one of the things about a military is, um, oftentimes it, it's it's a it has a, a greater deterrent effect when you don't use it when you. <laughs> Because when when you do use it, things break down, <laughs> people get lost, <laughs> all the all the things that can go wrong do go wrong, and I think that's exactly what happened to uh, uh, <clears throat> in with the Russian forces, and we sadly um, had not created a more realistic picture of their capabilities, and I think that led to. Um, uh, uh, General uh, General Milley, uh, Chairman of Joint Chiefs of Staff, testifying uh, before Congress uh, two weeks before the Russian invasion, he said the war will be over in three days. So you know, here's here's the most senior military official in the U.S. who's getting the best intelligence, saying he thinks it's going to be over in three days. Uh, that was simply a, a failure of of, of intelligence gathering uh, that led to that kind of an assessment. Uh, thank you. Um, so, uh, and by the way, I, I've been remiss in reminding our audience that if you have questions, please uh, do uh, post them in the chat. We do want to try to get to those. We have about 30 minutes remaining on the clock, so we definitely have some time for audience questions as well. But uh, while you think about questions or don't think about questions, uh, up to you. You don't have to ask questions. Um, I will uh, just move on to another question. Um, so, Stay, I guess, on the theme of politics and political support. Um, you know, we, as uh, 
both of you have kind of pointed out, um, you know, there have been more internal divisions in the U.S. Um, in recent months, I would say, um, suggesting that, you know, the U.S. should uh, reduce or eliminate its aid to Ukraine. Um, you know, how, how realistic a prospect is this happening? Is it really kind of, I mean, it, you know, when you look at the public opinion polls, it doesn't seem like the, there's majority support for I mean, there is majority support for continuing to help Ukraine, but um, but it is perhaps a little soft, certainly among Republicans. Um, but there's definitely divisions within the Republican Party. So um, so is that a, is that a matter of concern? Is it something that um, is, a, is a serious prospect or you know, how, how do you sort of um, uh, handicap the chances of, of that happening? And I guess, Matt, it's kind of your turn, I guess. <laughs> am, I, am I up on this one? Okay. Um, well, uh, well, it, it's always a matter of concern. That's, I'll just say that. It's always a matter of concern. Um, the, um, so the, the Biden administration has, has, an, has an advantage on this in that um, the Senate is still under the control of the Democratic Party. And uh, the Senate has overall a stronger role in foreign policy than the House when we look at compare the, the two chambers. Um, also, uh, the um, the um, the Republicans, at least right now, are not unified around an opposition uh, to the aid. There, there, there are factions that either are opposed to it or want uh, reduction in aid, but so to, to to make a full fight against the president on it, they have to they have to come together within their own conference. And one of the things that we saw in the recent uh, election of Speaker McCarthy is that that conference is um, um, split apart uh, in on, on many internally, which is which is 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 interesting from a in American political science background, because of course historically, um, you know, when when the when the Democrats had arguments amongst themselves, it was kind of like, well, that, that's sort of the Democrats, the Democratic Party, being the Democratic Party. I mean, they they don't just argue about the seats at the table; they argue about the table itself. They always have. That's kind of who they are. Um, but what's fascinating is that at one hand we've had some ideological polarization. Um, as the Democrats have become more liberal and as the Republicans have become more conservative, they've actually begun to have a fight amongst themselves as to <laughs> how conservative is conservative. And so, uh, um, uh, so and that's kind of inter just kind of interesting to watch that that play out. Um, I will say this as they crank up with the, um, the, the the presidential election and we're already in the presidential election cycle, um, especially now that the midterms are over. Um, this could become a major fight between the two sides. Uh, if there, if there is a, a and, and I don't know, I don't know if there's a, uh, you know, I don't know if there'll be a coalescing around former President Trump and if he stands up against, you know, uh, Ukrainian support, uh, that, that could change things. So, uh, but right now, I would say that, that Biden has the advantage, just has the advantage, as, as uh, <clears throat> Chair Lawrence pointed out, uh, he, he has public opinion on his side on this issue, not necessarily on other issues, uh, but on this issue. So in the short term, uh, I don't think it's going to have an impact on the funding. But I, I, I would I am open to seeing that over the long term, this could be a major this could be a major fissure. Uh, and, um, you know, the other thing that that happens within this is that the Republicans kind of have to be a little bit careful of. So the, the standard Republican opposition to any Democratic president is that the Democrat is weak. They weak because he's, he's the only one of these limp-wristed liberals, and, and that's what they are. They're the PC, peace-loving uh, peaceniks and the, the lovey-dovey hippies. And, and, and uh, so we, you know, we could just... But this group, this insurgent group within the Republican Party... They're taking the peacenik position here, which is is we're going to cut back. We should cut back on the support and the money and stuff like that. And so 
that that's an interesting place for the for a portion of the Republicans to be. Can they win out against the larger culture of the Republican Party, which is that when there's a perception that the national interest is at stake, <clears throat> then you unify behind the flag and you salute and you carry on and you say, Semper Fi, my country, do or die. Uh, so what what's going to happen within that? I don't know, but it will be interesting to watch. Yeah, and and, and um, yes to everything <laughs> Matt just uh, Matt just said, and and the only thing I, I if I could just add is again uh, this discussion. Um, I would argue um, at its root um has ha, has putin well it has putin's fingerprints all over it and this this idea through influence operations uh through info, info wars is to uh, of have created um a, a discussion within the republican party of of whether or not uh we should continue support for ukraine whether or not it should be open-ended should it be a blank check so all all of these uh, discussion points uh, arguably have putin's fingerprints all over them he, he wants this discussion to happen he wants this dissension uh to occur and he's going to feed into it whether to uh, russian television or or uh bots or uh you know um twitter or whatever the case may be that he's going to continue to flood um the, the uh, <clears throat> flood us with with things that will cause us to continue to talk about it because the more we talk about it the more it's going to take on a life of life of its own um so in my mind it's intentional now what's interesting and i what i expect to see happen uh now is okay well how do we how do we get the, the democratic party uh to begin to, to split on this and i i think we're going to begin to see the start two thing being spun differently um, and it's going to it's going to speak to the peace wing of the Democratic Party, uh, the you know threats of nuclear war, and and we're going to begin to see uh, more info war uh, warfare here, uh, more spinning of that, and so now we're, then that that peace movement of the Democratic Party will begin to stir up, and then you have the Republicans over here beginning to stir up, and um, that's that's going to then Europe is going to see that the EU countries are going to see that the NATO countries are going to see that. And they're going to begin having those discussions. And uh, so, again, it's back to that issue. Uh, how's the war going? Which one? Uh, is, it, is it the ground war or is it the political warfare? Because uh, as, as it's, it's kind, of like, kind of like the magician, you know, who's in misdirection. Uh, don't look over here. <laughs> you know, uh, you know look, I want you to look over here, but not, not the, the, the you know, where the, we're, 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 mi we're misdirecting you over here. So, mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, just to um, kind of follow up on that, we we brought up the and maybe for the, the benefit of some members of the audience, um, you know, could you explain a little bit more about you know what the Start Two Treaty is and why it's so important and kind of how it fits in with um, you know kind of the the broader conflict here. Oh well, I guess I can I can start unless Tom wants to take this. No, no, go ahead. Oh. no pun intended. Oh. I'm sure. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Untotally intended. Um, well, START stands for uh, Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, and um, um, and uh, it, it's it's a, it's along of, of a series of treaties that have an intellectual and diplomatic lineage that dates back to the Cold War, um, and they they really go all the way back to uh, um, the, um, the, the, uh, the, the 1960s uh, with some efforts of the Kennedy administration where they, they, they put the test ban treaty in. And, and, uh, and of course, most famously, the, famously the acronyms uh, come out of Nixon's efforts with SALT. Uh, the strategic, strategic Arms Limitations Treaty. So the difference between SALT and START was that START was about we're going to reduce the cap of the number of strategic weapons. And what they mean by that is nukes, uh, nukes at, at, at a lower level. Uh, so we're going to we're going to ice all we're going to cut off the uh, 
the um, uh, the arms race, the nuclear arms race. And so the the salt was we're going to limit the development, and the start was we're actually going to cut them back. And uh, they there was a a, a no one which was called sort, and we don't need to go into that. But uh, but sort sort never got ratified, and uh, and um, uh, we pulled out of it. But uh, but start um, start one and two. So this is two that's been been uh, been, been cut out. Uh, so start two was was began to be negotiated, I believe, with the second Bush administration. It was implemented by the Obama administration, if I have my dates correct on that. Um, and what Putin has done is he says, you know what, I'm not going to follow the treaty anymore. He says, so this is for something for the, the political science majors or those interested in it. You know, at the end of the day, uh, uh, Tom mentioned the Treaty of Westphalia. What the Treaty of Westphalia, 1648, what it really did is it instantiated the nation state system. That has said that that nation states have sovereign power, and so what that means is, at the end of the day, if I'm a nation state and Tom is a nation state, we cut a deal. At the end of the day, we have that deal. But if I decide, you know what, Tom, I don't like you anymore, so mm -hmm. I'm just not going to go by the deal because you know what, I'm I'm a sovereign power of the land of Matt. Um, mm -hmm. Well, that's what that's what Putin has done, uh, and. And so that has always been a kind of a limitation mm -hmm. on, you know, those people who talk about world government and all, all that stuff out there is that the greatest limitation is um, the sovereign system. And so that's what Putin is doing. Yeah. Yeah, it, at, at, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Again, Matt, yes. And uh, the only uh, one, one thing I would add to that in is uh, in, if you said I apologize that the the start treaty doesn't talk to tactical nuclear weapons which is one of the uh, which is part of russian uh, war doc, war doctrine is the use of tactical tactical nuclear weapons so, so in, right to your point matt um you know uh putin picked start two is to to say well i'm going to pull out of this and of course that was meant to uh, i think obliquely kind of uh, speak to the threat of, of of nuclear war the other part of that was russia wasn't following the start two treaty anyway um inspections hadn't been going on anyway um so he said i'm i'm not going to do something that he already wasn't doing so uh, but as as a as kind of an info war thing uh to pe to people who don't pay attention uh to to the nuance of it, it seem it, it comes off immediately as something that's threatening and oh my gosh we need to really pay attention here not realizing that it doesn't address the tactical nuclear weapons which right now are are probably most likely to be in play if if any nuclear weapon was um and that they weren't following it anyway so you know, uh, much like the um uh, uh, overflight uh, uh treaty that, that uh, pulled out of the russians were following it anyway <clears throat> Okay, um, <clears throat> so um, we've had our in our previous discussions, we've we've talked a lot about you know end games and exit strategies, and I mean, at least you know it seems a little bit maybe premature at this point to talk about, particularly you know given what uh, hasn't changed over the last few months. But um, you know, is there um, has that really changed? Is there kind of a any realistic settlement? Uh, of this conflict that um, would be mutually satisfactory to all the parties, um, and if not, what you know, what, what it, where do we go from here? Do we have just another frozen conflict, like I guess arguably we had from 2014 to 2022? Do we have, you know, or something like South Ossetia again, or um, or 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 what? Um, you know. Um, and, and is that something that realistically is going to be acceptable to the Ukrainians at this point? Did, did you want me to start, Matt? Or, yeah, or, I, I, yeah, yeah. I, um, <clears throat> I think that um, Zelensky said it, said it very succinctly. He said, this war started in Crimea and it's going to end in Crimea. Um, and I believe that as far as Ukraine is concerned, uh, the only realistic end game possible here, exit 
here is that Russia is out of the out of the Donbass and it's out of Crimea. Um, and I, I think the the game changer in all of this, uh, certainly those individuals who I've spoken with who say, uh, and, and here in Germany, they talk about, uh, you know, it's time right now for peace talks, is the, is the war crimes issue. Um, I think they, they are so obvious and so flagrant that they in and of themselves have made any uh, discussion of peace talks really um, hard to swallow. Um, because you would have to sit down at the table uh, with people who, who clearly committed incredible war crimes in the, in the 21st century. Um, how, do, how do you leave that? I guess the world would have to ask itself, is it prepared to say okay to that? That, you know, shucks, we shouldn't have done that, but, you know, uh, we, still, we, we still get to keep the Crimea and the Donbass. Um, and, and back to, to the Westphalia piece, um, it, it makes a mockery then uh, of the sovereign state system. Um, and and um, if, if Russia is allowed to, to say that uh, its intervention into, into the Donbass was because of, um, of, of a, a Russian ethnic presence, uh, let's, let's look at all the borders that are going to change in Africa when the colonial powers uh, set up borders that split ethnic groups. Um, those will now all come into question. Um, so the only realistic um, end state I see for myself is, is I believe what Zelensky says, the war will end in Crimea when Russia leaves and, um, and leaves the Donbass. Um, and I, I just, I'm not, <laughs> I, I think the, 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 the outcome, I don't think we would be prepared for the outcomes if we allowed uh, the present situation to, to uh, stand um, and, and what, what would occur in other parts of the world, what, what door we would open there. Uh, yes, I, I agree with, with all of that. I agree with everything Tom said. I, I think that uh, um, it, it, you've opened up, you open up a Pandora's box um, when you, when you allow, if you will, the Russian way of war to be the uh, the accepted um, way of war, uh, and the um, now I would say this: uh, I, I do think it's possible. Uh, Chair Lawrence here brought up something. Uh, I think it's possible that they could get into a a kind of freezing of lines, uh, like they did between fifteen and twenty one. Uh, with limited incursions on each side and that sort of, I think that could happen again, mostly out of the extent uh, uh, because of the exhaustion of the field armies in play. Uh, um, but that is not a long-term solution. I mean, unless you want to say that the Korean War has been a long-term solution. Well, we we've, we've been sitting down, standing, you know, artillery pieces facing eighty north and south mm -hmm. against each other now since '53. Um, uh, so I, I do think you could have something like that. But the difficulty is that if you have that, you're always going to have an opening for a new round of offensives and counteroffensives. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You don't actually have. Um, you know, unless you can negotiate a truce, but if, if President Zelensky sticks with his guns, and I think Tom is right on this, uh, President Zelensky does not want to barter away Crimea, and he doesn't, doesn't want to borrow away the Donbass or really any part of Ukraine, because mm -hmm. to a large extent, he himself has tied. So we've talked a little bit about how, how Putin is, <coughs> is tied to this war politically, but this is true of Zelensky as well. Mm -hmm. Zelensky's mm -hmm. power base within his own country is that he has been able to rise above the fray of politics and be the war leader uh, who holds the nation together to include even the people who otherwise who stand kind of opposed to him, uh, the, the opposition parties and whatnot, um, and the former leaders and so forth. So. He he also is between uh, a rock and a hard place 
um, uh, on all of this. But again, I, I think if you have exhaustion on both sides, which you could definitely get to, um, now short of that, could the West get tired of buttressing the Ukraine? Uh, that's certainly a possibility, especially if there is a strong movement of the peace forces in Europe, and yes, the, the peace wing of the Democratic Party. Uh, mm -hmm. And if that is particularly if President Biden feels that his reelection is contingent on that, um, well, you might see if you see a retreat of the West on this. Now, this is a little bit spec speculative. I don't think this will happen. But if you did, then that would be a uh, that would be a gateway for for the Russians uh, to go in uh, and and mm -hmm. and. Uh, particularly if they successfully build up, if they can build up an alliance with some of the other uh, Belarus and Moldova and and uh, and even um, bringing in, you know, monies and stuff from the Chinese. Um, so. The, the problem with wars is that uh, um, they don't start well and they very often don't end well. And. Um, uh, no matter what happens within this, there's going to be acrimony on both sides. And even if we do find a way to cease this conflict, it might just serve as a predecessor uh, for a, a, a setting condition for a wider conflict uh, mm -hmm. that could come down. But a lot of it's going to come down. Do we have support? Uh, will we will we continue to support the Ukrainians? Will Putin be able to hold the oligarchs on his side? Um, and Either one of those goes a different way, you could have a different outcome. Yeah, I, I, if if I could, and 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 thanks for 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 your comment, Matt. It makes great great good sense. And as you're talking, it made me think of 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 one. You know, we look at North Korea, South Korea, and a you know a, a demilitarized zone, or the case may be. It it would be interesting to at least have the discussion of. Um, stabilizing the the again not not giving up territory but we'll 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 just say okay as of this day um Crimea and the Donbass uh the, he's already Putin's already annexed the Donbass I mean so he, he's calling that Russian territory anyway is, is that um uh we go ahead and and, and stop here and the EU uh, EU fast tracks uh, Ukraine into the European Union, and we look at uh, Ukraine as a de facto NATO state. Anyway, um, it's a NATO state in everything but name, and we fa fast track its NATO status. And now, then, that line is stabilized because any crossing over it uh, would trigger Article Five uh, of the NATO Treaty. Um, and then figure out how we deal with uh, with Crimea and and the Donbass, uh, Luhansk regions, um, because then right to to your point, Matt, uh, if it, it as a NATO state, uh, Putin wouldn't dare um, cross the line. Uh, but if we allow it to stabilize and Ukraine just to simply be continue to be Ukraine, well, it, that's just a matter of of getting my forces ready to go again at another point. Um, and and I think we need to, in the West, need to just realize Ukraine is, is right now a de facto NATO state and and quit talking around like it's something else, um, like it's our hired help defending the West, uh, <laughs> um, when in fact, when in fact it's, it, it's clearly uh, in the West. And so it, first step, step, fast track EU membership, second, Fast track NATO uh, membership, and then uh, then use Article Five to stabilize the situation. That then set, could they then could set up um, meaningful peace talks. Yeah, I think the uh, just kind of uh, I, as we were discussing this, I was kind of thinking through other kind of frozen conflicts. Right, I'm thinking about, for example, Cyprus. Right, um, where there actually is the precedent of. Uh, the EU admitting a divided state, um, and although the NATO thing isn't really quite the same thing there, um, you know, it, you know, essentially it would be a proxy conflict between two NATO powers. So, um, 
you know, the, neither of them really has much of an incentive to reignite that war. Um, um, and then, you know, Bosnia, for example, where you have a de facto Serbian state, a de facto uneasy alliance between the Croats and the, the Muslims. Um, is either of those things kind of the model here for what could you know, come about where essentially you have, you know, a de facto autonomous Donbass and Crimea that isn't legally part of Russia, but kind of, you know, is. <laughs> um, but again, you know, at the end of the day, right, is that acceptable to the Ukrainians? Is that acceptable to the West? Is that acceptable yeah. to Putin, right? Um, you know, because clearly Putin has taken out the issue. This is as Russian as Moscow, right? And mm -hmm. of course, you know, Zelensky has staked out that, you know, the Donbass is as Ukrainian as live, right? So, um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. No, I, yeah. No, I, th I think, I think uh, as you said, um, the Balkans provide uh, us with a, a framework um, that we could look at. Um, again, you know, for that matter, yeah, yeah, yeah we, we would have to, we'd have to, you know, play with it a little bit, but I think, I think there's a framework there that we could look at and certainly, uh, have colleagues, um, in the Slovenian, um, uh, ministry of defense. And this is one of the things we talk about is looking at, uh, at the, the Balkan wars and, and, um, current, current situation, uh, in, in the Balkan states as a, a kind of a model for what we might be able to push forward in, in Ukraine. Okay, I, I, I would I would agree. I would agree that the only thing that I would I would say on it that the that, that, that the challenge is going to be it would you could box Serb you could box Serbia in. You could box Serbia in, which is what NATO did, uh, led by the US. Mm -hmm. You can't do that mm -hmm. with Russia. And that and that that that's mm -hmm. that that's gonna that's gonna be the, that's gonna be where the rubber meets the road. That's gonna be the mm -hmm. problem. But but I do I, I completely agree that could be a potential way out of this autonomous mm -hmm. regions, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a no man zone, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, there's is we do stuff like this all um, for God's sakes, we still got yeah. we still got the Egyptians and the Israelis separated from the October war. Uh, so, I mean, it's it, it it's we've done this before. We could do this again. But the difficulty right. yeah. is that it's Russia. Mm -hmm. Right. And Russia's big and Russia's powerful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, I, I guess, you know, as you said, right, it is the, um, you know, like I said, we do have plenty of these frozen conflicts, right? Um, you know, some do, some work out better than others, perhaps. But, um, yeah, I, yeah, I hadn't even thought of, you know, the, uh, you know, uh, Israeli-Egypt, you know, Sinai sort of situation, right? Um, but, yeah, um, so this is, a, you know, we, we've arrived at the end of our uh, evening, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on your perspective, I guess. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah. I'd like to uh, thank you uh, for uh, uh, both uh, taking time out of your evenings, or uh, I think in Tom's case, I didn't realize you were in Germany, and you, like yeah. your early morning at this point, um, and yeah. I realized you were uh, joining us from uh, five time zones away or six time zones away. I would have uh, uh, <laughs> uh, maybe uh, thought about a different time, um, but uh, but thank you, Tom. Thank yeah. you, uh, Matt. Um, and uh, thank you all for joining us. Um, you know, if you do have any questions for our panelists, feel free to email. Uh, us We're happy to answer any questions you might have. Um, um, not as lively an audience as usual, but um, that's part of the course, I guess. Sometimes, um, and uh, you know, Dr. B also like to thank. I don't know if you saw in the chat. Thank you both for your participation as well. Yeah. Um, just uh, one little piece of housekeeping before we adjourn for the evening. Um, our next discussion event, we're gonna we have it planned for uh, uh, two weeks from. Thursday, um, so a little bit of a time difference. Uh, so it's going to be Thursday, uh, the 9th. Uh, we're going to be talking about state politics. Um, uh, the lineup is not quite set yet, but uh, but state politics is going to be the main topic as we approach the uh, end of the legislative session um, in the next few weeks. So I know that uh, Dr. Lester is definitely going to be participating, and I believe Dr. Hall will also be participating as well. We'll see if anybody else will be joining us as well for that. But uh, hopefully you all will join us as well as audience members and audience as well. Um, and I'd like to thank you all for taking time out of your all's evenings. and. Uh, uh, as uh, has been the case for our earlier um, 
uh, discussion events. We'll be posting this on our YouTube channel um, uh, later on as soon as the transporting and all that good stuff ha takes place, um, which probably be sometime tomorrow is when I get that posted. Um, and you can find our past videos, including our past discussion events on Ukraine. I think we've had two or three now already um, uh, on our YouTube channel, which is just youtube.com slash at sign uh, MGA Pulse I, which is also our uh, short handle on other social media as well. We're also at MGA Pulse I on Facebook and Twitter um, as well. So Thank you all again, and thank you all for joining us. And uh, we'll see you hopefully in a couple of weeks. That's good. Bye. Take it easy. Have a good evening. Good night. Thank Thanks. you for you participating, everybody. Take yeah, care. Thank you. Bye.